Uh, welcome everybody to the first of the 15 presentations that we call the Athena Talks. Uh, my name is Tigran Haas and I'm the director of the Center for the Future of Places at the School of Architecture and the Built Environment. A new center that has been established uh, on the 16th of September. And uh, this is one of the events that we have planned. Uh, an event that will take us, uh, we start now, today, this afternoon. And it will, will end in December 2018. Uh, the Athena Lecture Series is, um, I would say, uh, very interesting and unique in many ways. Uh, and it's a series that is comprised of a distinguished female international faculty. Females only. So, uh, and uh, they are the leading researchers in uh, academic fields of urban sociology, architecture, planning, human geography, urban design, and landscape architecture. Uh, and as I said, this is the part of the Center for the Future of Places. So behind me, you can see in the slides the 15 participants that we're going to have here at KTH. And the format is that this, uh, the talks are going to be going to be talks that are uh, sort of state-of-the-art issues in, in different disciplines. And each talk will be followed, not followed, but it, there will be a, a specific program built around each guest. Either the guests will participate in a workshop or in a round table, or they will be leading a, a doctoral course or running a master's course, or there'll be something else happening with that event. So we're looking really forward to these 15 distinguished speakers uh, coming to KTH. Um, I have a real pleasure to introduce, I'll probably have to repeat this every time so it's, uh, uh, it looks, uh, sounds uh, real, because, but this really at the beginning, one of my favorite uh, colleagues. Uh, Professor Emily, Emily Tallon from the University of Chicago. Uh, Emily has been with us before uh, on a number of occasions and she is the one that's going to open the series today. And the title of this talk today is Design for Social Diversity. Emily's also been a professor in the University, State University of Arizona and also a professor at University of Illinois um, Champaign. Uh, she uh, has a degree in the city and regional planning from Ohio State University and uh, as I said, it's been associated with the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Illinois, which is one of our strategic uh, partners. We have an alliance with that university. Uh, her research is devoted to urban design and urbanism, especially the relationship between the built environment and social equity. And it's uh, one of the most uh, well-cited uh, urban design researchers of today. Uh, she's also edited a number of several volumes and uh, also written a number of key texts in the field. And you can see on the right slide some of the books that Emily has done. Uh, City Rules, Design for Diversity, uh, New uh, Urbanism and American Planning, and uh, uh, one of the recent ones, Urban Design Reclaimed, as well as the second edition of the <laughs> Charter for New Urbanism. Sort of this expanded a uh, big volume uh, of the Charter for New Urbanism, uh, which was done, the first, I think it was done in 1993, the, the Red Book. And this is now an updated version with a number of prominent uh, uh, researchers and practitioners that have contributed to this volume. So uh, with no further overdo, uh, ado, I would like to give the, the floor to Emily to open this uh, Athena talk series. And uh, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Institute, Emily. And after the uh, talk, we're going to have a questions and answers uh, session, but my colleague and Dr. Ann Nagyby will sort of reflect on one or two things from Emily's talk, which will open up the discussion. So, welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for, um, for coming, and thank you for that warm welcome, Tigran. You are the best feminist I know. There we go. Inviting all these women. <laughs> We're so proud of you. Um, so I changed the title of my talk a little bit. I hope that's okay. I um, and I'll t I guess you'll understand why. Um, I want to talk about um, it's it's actually it's all interrelated. Design for social diversity, new urbanism, walkable diversity. It's all kind of in my mind. If you step back and try to take a big picture view of what's going on here. Um, these things are, there's no need to really kind of parse terms too much. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what new urbanism is, although everyone's heard of it. Um, it's often very much mischaracterized. Um, but I want to really hone in on two key principles that I think are the most, by far the most important 
dimensions of what it is we're trying to do in new urbanism. Um, and that is um, walkability and diversity. And so I'm going to dig down a little bit on what those terms actually mean, what we know about, what's going on with those, uh, with those principles. Um, I think, uh, to me, one thing I've really been struggling with my whole career is to what degree can we have some normative principles that are kind of hardwired about what we're trying to do to create better human settlements? <clears throat> or is everything just relative? Like, how do you really judge that sprawl is a bad thing and that you know monocultures of urbanism are a bad thing and what's a good thing and how can we say that and are we constantly in an argumentative mode about figuring that out or can we just say look these are some principles they're inalienable rights like the US Constitution and we're going to move on from there and debate about how to implement those things that's what I've really struggled with uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about, about these principles, these I'm going to call them meta principles, just two of them. And whether you talk about it as good urbanism or new urbanism, to me, it's, uh, that's all kind of the same thing. I'll talk a little bit about how these principles have, have evolved. Um, it's very much a US-based kind of um, discussion in that sense. Um, I am an Americanist, and you know, hopefully you can draw something from that in your own country. Um, and then future prospects, where are we going with these uh, principles that are so important? Um, first of all, just a quick definition of what is urbanism, because I hear a lot of different definitions about that. At my own institution, University of Chicago, there are a lot of people floating around who call themselves urbanists, and you know, there's no lock on the term, anyone can use it. Um, but they really, to me, they aren't urbanists because they don't have that focus on the built environment. So that's kind of number one for me um, in my definition. Built environment, and how does it affect all these other things? and in turn is affected by, so this two-way kind of street. And that could be about social justice, access, health, community, all these things listed here are all these other sort of dimensions. But built environment at the core of all these things circ circling around. <clears throat> so um, this notion of using the built environment in that way to advance all these other principles is rooted in the 19th century and the response to the industrial city, which was, it was a brand new kind of field. This is how the whole field of urban design and urban planning emerges. And um, so it's really a product of those reform efforts. And so what we're doing right now, if we try to think about what, what's going on now and that link to the 19th century root of this, um, we still are looking at that built environment, and in a lot of cases, it's about the disinvestment going on um, and the um, degraded conditions that a lot of people find themselves in. But in addition now, which is how it's different from the 19th century, we have all of these other dimensions uh, that are interlinked to that problem with the inner city um, but with, or with existing cities. But now all the traffic, the monocultures, the parking lots, all the rest of it, um, that's all part of the game too, which wasn't necessarily there in the, in the 19th century. So new urbanism is really in that tradition is the point I'm trying to make. So what are these meta principles? Um, and again, I'm trying to, I would love it if everyone in this room would agree with me that these are in fact meta principles and we need, we need to all just sort of come together that, yeah, there's no debate about this. Now, I don't, I don't presume that that is true at all. My friend Dan Solomon will disagree with me, I'm sure. But um, I would like to get into that debate, it would be great. Um, so first, meta principle number one, human scale. Um, and you can also talk about that in terms of um, walkability. Uh, and this is simply that the human habitat ought to be scaled to the human body, walkable, and that body is self-propelled. 
whether by a wheelchair, whether by walking, your two legs, biking, you are propelling yourself around. Building to that scale tends to contract the built environment. And so human scale then uh, implicates other things like connectivity, proximity, access, smallness, enclosure, all kinds of things sort of spill out from that. Um, and I would say a lot of good things are associated with this simple rule. Um, the human scale principle intersects with sustainable cities, for example. Uh, all of these things that we get by building to human scale uh, that you know people weren't even necessarily focused on um, 20 years ago, but you know the lower carbon emissions, the lower miles traveled by car, the um, making transit more feasible, you know um, implications for equity and health. There's some um, debatability. We can debate about some of those dimensions. Um, spirituality, civ civility, happiness, all of these things have been argued and have been, um, um, you know, people have advocated that human scale is producing um, advances in all of these areas. Now this, this simple rule, though, unleashes a lot of complication and complexity. It's by no means a simple rule. Um, there are some things that are um, kind of fun to work out about this simple rule, um, like visualizing human scale, um, the human scale habitat, what that might look like. Um, and a lot of people are very much engaged in proposing the visualization of this. Um, but then um, you also need to work out design requirements in multiple dimensions for this human scale. You need to have it in two dimensions, and that's about accessibility. You need to have it in three dimensions, and in four dimensions, three dimensions over time. So that, that core principle um, does have some complexity. And then there's all the things working against the human scale that we're confronting all the time. Um, things that are working in the opposite direction. And these are big money things. And these are things with a lot of political power. And that is undermining our attempts to, um, to build at that human scale. Um, in the US, I don't know how your Wall Street situation is here, but um, you know the built environment is 35% of the asset base of the US economy. Um, and these are the uh, real estate products. This is from a book by Chris Leinberger, The Option of Urbanism. All the buying and selling of real estate product on Wall Street completely detached from something like the human scale. So there's a lot of money flowing around, a lot of money that goes into support types of built, envir of in built environments that have absolutely nothing to do with human scale. Uh, then there's the whole problem of, um, of the rules underlying, underlying uh, built environment and how they counteract human scale. And um, this was the subject of my book, City Rules, really kind of digging into what are those rules and how do they affect the built environment. Uh, and you know, the city of Phoenix has 264 zoning categories and it's just a complete mess because of all the political power going on into um, rezoning particular neighborhoods, overlay districts that go on. Um, I know, I'd be curious to know how that, how such regulations happen over here. I, I'm assuming it's much more civilized. Um, Chicago, where I live now, I used to pick on Phoenix so much, and um, I still do, but Chicago is really no picnic either, and the zoning code, the rules underlying the built environment and how it gets coerced into shape are very complicated, and um, they're very much a product of deal-making that goes on, uh, rather than a concerted effort to create a particular built environment that would be good for the human scale. Um, building practices that have not really paid attention to the public realm, things that might be good for the human scale, that uh, a consistent street wall, a um, you know, integration, sense of enclosure, 
those things are important for human scale, not happening. Um, the entrenched culture that prioritizes building buildings as individual objects floating in space. This happens to be a graphic from a 19, um, 1929 uh, regional plan for New York and environs, which was about you know, advocating for buildings floating in space so that you could have sunlight uh, around all sides. Well, what does that do to your human scale um, that could have a very damaging effect? And of course, our crazy landscape urbanist friends doing um, crazy things that um, really are often oblivious to human scale, I would argue. They might look pretty, but um, not exactly conducive. Okay, so that's my argument for this first meta principle. Meta principle number two is, um, let's call it spatial equity, it could be called diversity, it could be called spatial diversity, um, and there are all kinds of different definitions here too, but I really mean this in a geographic sense, and that is equality of access as a meta principle, as an aspirational principle. Um, that everyone has equitable access to the good stuff and equitable distance from the bad stuff. So this is an aspiration. This is a principle we're going for. Um, the question is how in the world are you going to pull that off? And I think that um, I tried to find some creative graphic that would explain <coughs> this um, explain this principle geographically. Um, I would say there are really kind of two ways of making sure there's this spatial equity, spatial in a geographic sense. Um, either you're going to ensure that every neighborhood has access to all the good stuff equally, or you're going to work toward neighborhood scale diversity within it. So here's what I mean. Uh, let's say you have um, all these red diamonds are schools, good quality schools, and um, green, the green squares are where all the rich people are living and the other squares are where all the poor people are living. Well, it really is not very realistic that, um, that this is the kind of distribution that's going to go on. Really, it's going to be more like this distribution, just an example. Um, and probably a very Americanized example. Um, and uh, so this is really what we get. So rather than trying to go for that, which is politically unrealistic, the idea is to go for this. So keep those good schools in their particular locations, but build the underlying population uh, diversity that would support those uh, urban qualities that everyone wants to have access to. Now, what does diversity mean? I never try to pin down an exact definition because it doesn't exist. Um, there are, there's, I've heard cases for family type diversity, age diversity, certainly racial and ethnic diversity is critical. Um, I do tend to focus on income level diversity because I think it's a more realistic um, goal. Uh, family type and age type is probably pretty realistic too. What does the built environment have to do with this? Well, you know that Jane Jacobs, um, her approach was about um, you know, short blocks and mixed ages of buildings and mixing primary uses and having population concentration. Those were her underlying qualities of diversity. And, um, and, and this is a really important and interesting topic, is to try to get at what are these built environment qualities of, um, of diversity. But lately I've gotten a little cynical about it because it seems to me what's happening is the more we go for these qualities that are supposed to underline diversity, the more we make, we actually are having a reverse effect because these qualities are so desirable because people want to live in a non-homogenous kind of environment. They want the small scale, they want the mix of ages, they want distribution, just an example, um, and probably a very Americanized example. Um, 
And uh, so this is really what we get. So rather than trying to go for that, which is politically unrealistic, the idea is to go for this. So keep those good schools in their particular locations, but build the underlying population uh, diversity that would support those uh, urban qualities that everyone wants to have access to. Now, what does diversity mean? I never try to pin down an exact definition because it doesn't exist. Um, there are, there's, I've heard cases for family type diversity, age diversity, certainly racial and ethnic diversity is critical. Um, I do tend to focus on income level diversity because I think it's a more realistic um, goal. Um, family type and age type is probably pretty realistic too. What does the built environment have to do with this? Well, you know that Jane Jacobs, um, her approach was about um, you know, short blocks and mixed ages of buildings and mixing primary uses and having population concentration. Those were her underlying qualities of diversity. And, um, and, and this is a really important and interesting topic is to try to get at what are these built environment qualities of, um, of diversity. But lately I've gotten a little cynical about it because it seems to me what's happening is the more we go for these qualities that are supposed to underline diversity, the more we make, we actually are having a reverse effect because these qualities are so desirable because people want to live in a non-homogenous kind of environment. They want the small scale, they want the mix of ages, they want short blocks. Those dimensions are making these places, we're loving them to death and we're actually limiting the degree of diversity. Does that mean we shouldn't look for built environment qualities um, that can theoretically support diversity? I would say you know, absolutely not. We still love these qualities we just have a little more work to do to make sure that we're not undermining the very principle we're trying to go for. So here's what happened in Greenwich Village where Jane Jacobs wrote her book and where she was really formulating these <coughs> principles of diversity. And um, I did some calculations with something called the Simpson Diversity Index. There's lots of different measures of there, out there about how to measure diversity. Um, the, uh, so this number, 3.54 and 3.81, those are the diversity <laughs> indices for those two tracks where Jane Jacobs lived, and the little red dot there, um, sort of in the middle of the two tracks, was, um, was the area she was talking about. So this is the diversity index in 1970. By 2010, you can see that those numbers are now 1.6, and 2.1. So on the measure of income diversity with those wonderful built environment qualities, we all know diversity as measured by income, but race and ethnicity is going to be the same um, and probably family type. Um, that diversity just isn't holding. So was Jane Jacobs wrong? No, she wasn't wrong, but um, maybe we need to rethink what are these qualities that are going to get us to where we want to go? A couple more complexities to all of to these, both of these meta principles. Um, one is what are the what are the gradations of human scale and spatial equity? What are the levels of intensity that we're going for? How do you design? Um, what are the design implications of this? Because it's one thing to talk about human scale and spatial equity in New York and Manhattan. It's another to talk about it in Santa Fe, New Mexico. These are very different kinds of environments. And so, you know, this concept of a transect has, uh, which is actually very old, dates back to the 19th century, if not even earlier, um, is sort of a way of thinking about how these meta principles might vary according to this level of intensity. And what about um, just thinking more about the design implications of this? The modernists, too, the high modernists, the Corbusiers of the world, um, they wanted spatial equity. They actually talked about that. Um, they had their own interpretation of human scale. 
Um, but their ideas tended to be very dependent on government subsidy, for one thing. Um, and not to mention, the whole approach was extremely top-down. Um, and I would say, and I, probably a lot of you would agree, that actually this is not very human scale, um, the way we might think about it. Um, car dependent, you know, not really getting around by propelling yourself. So those are just some more complexities to think about. And then, of course, we have the, um, the sustainable city, Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, which is claiming that it is the most sustainable city in the world. Uh, but of course, um, the city relies on um, some solar energy um, and other renewable sources, but um, it's funded by oil revenues. So that kind of, um, kind of kills it. It's, we call it in new urbanism, gizmo green. Um, social diversity is very much lacking here. It's a green enclave for the wealthy. Um, it's a bit like the Jetsons. So I just throw this example as, you know, we talk a lot about the sustainable city, but if you go back to those principles of human scale and spatial equity, some things that are calling themselves sustainable cities might not really be achieving it. Okay, um, what about the, uh, the evolution of, um, of some of these ideas? I'll just go through that kind of quickly. What I've always really liked about new urbanism is that it's trying to combine different sets of ideals that in previous decades did not get along with each other at all. So it's taking some very, very different kinds of um, ways of thinking about cities. Um, but in one sense, I would say that human scale and spatial equity, which we could term walkable diversity, are pretty much what these reform movements were about in one sense of it. They might not have used terms like access and service and beauty and function, um, but they were still there. And I think the essence of it is tying all these things together. Um, so as we know, the industrial city widely regarded as socially unjust, regarded by many as a problem um, with the underlying economic system loss of connection between nature and society, um, and the responses to it were really kind of in four different dimensions. I argue this in um, the first book I wrote. And I'll just quickly go through what these different dimensions are. Um, the first I call incrementalism. So there was one reform group was very much about working with the existing city and trying to make people's lives better one playground at a time. Jane Addams in, um, in Chicago was about putting in public baths or you know, getting the streets to be better taken care of or uh, funding schools, um, but very much engaged with the existing city, not at all interested in, in uh, getting rid of it or wiping it out in any way. And so I think in this sense, um, she was, there's a continuum in some sense with her and Jane Jacobs, um, this small scale incremental approach to reform. Um, another completely different approach was more of the professional planning approach. Um, the idea that what we really need to do with the city is not attempt to do these little incremental things, but to rewrite the rules, to get more investment, to really be concerned with the commercial city and um, making sure that big investors want to play. And so, of course, you had all these, you know, the famous plan of Chicago, you have the commercial club, the re lots of white men sitting around tables, kind of figuring out, you know, what to do, very top down. Um, and actually, this is the root of the professional planning uh, group right now, professional planning. Um, and, and they were really kind of pragmatists, so that's where zoning comes in, really trying to work within the existing city. Um, it started out as a city efficient, and then it became the city practical. The city beautiful was really tied into that group too. The city beautiful morphed into the city efficient in the span of a couple of years. So, and it was the same people. So um, really from, uh, from the same piece of plot. 
Um, then you have, of course, the garden cities. Now, this is a different kind of approach to reform, also born in the 19th century, but again, not going to mess with incremental um, uh, fixes for the city, not going to mess with um, trying to get um, you know, re uh, reform of the commercial banking system or you know, zoning rules or something like that, but instead um, whole new, let's start over outside of the city and create a garden city. Um, and this was very much uh, very much uh, a system of planned colonization, complete communities away from the central city, um, surrounded by green belts maybe, and this took off all over the world. I know you've had garden cities here, they became garden suburbs, because they didn't really have a source of employment. Um, in the US, there were many, many garden cities, and gar but they were really more like garden suburbs. And our most famous example in the beginning was Radburn, New Jersey, in the lower left there. Um, and uh, they weren't, I mean, they didn't really pan out as well as it had been hoped. Um, a fourth kind of approach is uh, what we would call regionalism. And the original regionalists, also coming out of the 19th century, um, they were a really heady group. And they really thought deeply about the place of urbanism in nature, the underlying processes that would generate change, the um, really dynamic interplay between urban places and their hinterlands and as those things were not to be separate they were to be interconnected complex thinking deep thinking um, if you've ever tried to read patrick gettys you know what i'm talking about absolutely impossible to read his um evolution um evolution of the city it's really really difficult sometimes i make my students read it just to punish them um, but what's interesting is that they really had a political voice. They had the ear of the president. Here's FDR going over a regional plan. And um, so, uh, you know, this was unheard of now, of course. So what happens when you put these four groups together? You know, the new urbanists were really, as I said, trying to take the best of out out of all four of these reform traditions emerging out of the 19th century. And um, what's, what's kind of interesting is that, you know, they say, okay, incrementalism, we love you, we love the freedom, we love the diversity, the vitality. Um, regionalism, we love your environmental stewardship, we love your, um, your positioning of the urban within nature, we think that's really important. Garden cities, we love your sense of place, we love your diagrams, we love the beauty, we love civic art, that's so essential to it. And zoning, we love, we love your pragmatism, we love your tools, we love that you are using to de design for economic gain. Um, all of that resonates. And so what's, what's really been, been interesting is how, in fact, initially, and it goes on now, some of these camps, they really don't get along. And there's a literature on this, um, you know, the, the regionalists thought that that zoning practical tool kind of approach was really detrimental because what you really want to do is engage in a much more fundamental way with the structure of urbanism, with the underlying processes. The, and so that means uh, when we had FDR in charge and the New Deal planners, they were actually thinking about how to, um, re, you know, how to restructure urban economics in a way that would generate a better approach to urbanism. Um, and they thought that this, the whole zoning approach was really just tinkering around. These two groups, very much at odds. Jane Jacobs, of course, through her, her whole book, is talking about the, you know, what, a, what an idiot Ebenezer Howard was and uh, how his, his, he was simplistic and his prescriptions for the Garden City were as if he didn't know what human beings really wanted. Um, and so that's, that's a big tension there. Um, 
And so, and so you see how there are these sort of internal conflicts uh, sort of hardwired into the whole system here, trying to pull these reform movements together. And now what does all this mean for now? What I see is that these traditions are still happening. Um, right now what you have is DIY urbanism, tactical urbanism. Dan Solomon was calling it dinking around or dinkification or something like that. Um, but you know, small scale chair bombing, you know, doing these small scale kind of interventions. Um, perhaps you could make the case that there's this is the now 100 years later uh, version of Jane Addams. Um, and then I think what's happened to regionalism is it's more about, I would say, it's less radical. It's more about the science of sustainability. Um, but I think that the Patrick Geddes uh, and Lewis Mumford and um, Benton Mackay and those folks, they would very much still be in this camp. They would like the scientific um, nature of it all. Um, I think what's happening in that sort of pragmatist uh, belt there is much more um, sophisticated approaches to zoning. Um, at least in the U.S., we're getting better at it. There's a lot of reform effort going on um, with form-based codes. And then I think with the um, what's happening with garden cities, nobody's really doing garden cities. But uh, we are doing sprawl retrofit, which looks a little like trying to create a kind of garden city, really garden suburb environment um, out there at the outskirts. Um, so uh, I want to propose that what's been happening, and this is all under this category of um, evolution of these ideas, um, if you wanted to be charitable, you would talk about this tactical, lean, incremental as being very creative approach. The planners are now being very strategic, and, and the environmentalists and the scientists and the developers are retrofitting, you know, that, that garden city is about retrofitting. If you wanted to be less charitable, you would look at those tactical people as just a bunch of hipsters who are, um, you know, lost their sense of civic prominence. The planners are still bureaucrats, the environmentalists are bureaucrats, and the developers are just trying to get a buck. So um, that's about the evolution. Now, what's what are we doing going forward with all this? And how much time do I have? I have enough. 20 minutes for sure. Okay. Um, so what's happening in the future here? Um, Still, I would say that I, all of this stuff going on, whether it's tactical or zoning reform or sustainable cities and getting the science right or um, you know, retrofitting sprawl and trying to make, take something that hasn't been working and make it better, I think that all of this is still needing to be focused on the end game in that no matter what you're doing, you are working toward those two principles of human scale and social equity, walkable diversity. I think when you step back and you take a look at what's happened um, with this project, this project of ours to create walkable diversity, human scale and spatial equity, um, What's happening is that these two things are in conflict with each other. I'll show you what I mean. Not aspirationally, but as it's playing out on the ground. So in the US case, and this is going to be very different from um, what's happening in Sweden, I imagine. Um, from what I've seen, you have an awfully uh, wonderful walkable city here. Um, but on the walkable front, we have this thing called walk score. Do you have that here? You heard of that walk score? Never heard of it. No, man. There is. We have. Well, you have it. Okay. Well, it's just a it's just a measure one can use to get a sort of sense of the walkability of your environment, and it's based on access. It's not based on is there enclosure and is there you know good frontage and 
are the blocks short or any of that. Um, it's really just you're standing in the city. What can you walk to? And how many things can you walk to? So it's, people criticize it a lot, but I actually think it's a really useful tool um, because it wasn't that long ago that we had no way of saying that about an entire world, being able to get that sense of how walkable an environment was. Um, we had to go out and get parcel level data, which is a real pain in the butt. So um, just to give you a sense of where we are in the US with this, a walk, here's a walk score of 80. So the score goes from zero to 100. If you're in the 90 to 100 category, you're really walkable. Um, 80 is considered walkable. You know, it's often not that walkable, but it's, uh, it, it's like average density of 18 units per acre. This happens to be in, um, in Queens, New York. So it's this kind of environment. Not high density, really, um, but, you know, good frontage usually, still plenty of cars. In the city of Chicago, this is what the walk score situation is. You see you have that 80 to 89 and 90 to 100. Concentrated in the, you know, the downtown loop is right there in the center. This doesn't work, right? I guess not. Um, anyway, uh, but you can see most of this environment is below 80 which would be kind of a bottom line for the walkable. Um, so how many, what percent of the population is living in a walk score of 80 or above? In the US, it's a mere 7%. This red one? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, let me just show you where that is. The down, the very downtown, which we call the loop, is right here. So this whole northwest side of Chicago is pretty walkable. But you see a vast amount of, and this is all pretty dense, um, not, not walkable at all. So 7%. Last time I measured, this is a couple years old, but I don't have any hope that this is much better now. Um, so that's, that's a really small, uh, and I'm not even including uh, suburb, or, you know, exurbs as we call them. I'm not counting all that land out there with farms and whatever. This is a measure of people living in MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas, so urban areas. So not doing so good on the walkable human scale front. Um, on the diversity front, so this is Chicago again. And here in a nutshell is what, ha what is happening. So this is 1970 income diversity, the darker, the more income diverse, okay? And that's where the walkability was, and still is. And actually, that's pretty cool. That's a good relationship between walkability. These are the centroids. These red dots are the centroids of a census block group, which is one of our statistical units for me that the census provides. And so that's 1970, and here's 2010. And you're like, what is going on? That all that diversity that was here in that walkable environment is no longer diverse. Totally priced out. We don't have that income diversity. It's a classic case of gentrification and displacement going on. So this is really um, frustrating. A lot of people um, at the latest New Urbanist Conference, I can tell you there was an awful lot of sessions about this very problem. What is going on? We're creating these beautiful walkable places and they're no longer, they're losing their social diversity that they were designed to support. So this key principle we were going for is not happening. This is from a study of um, public housing in the US. Now you guys do a much better job with subsidized housing than the US does. We do not do much public housing, but in Chicago, there's quite a bit. Um, and so these green dots are the centroids of a census block group that has at least 5% of the housing in that block group is, uh, subsidi is public housing. Um, and you can see this very much a lack of correlation going on between walkability 
and public housing, which is unfortunate, it's political reality, but it's unfortunate because people in public housing could benefit so much from living in walkable, i.e. well accessed um, kind of, uh, and so that's a problem. Uh, in fact, I did a study, this is a couple years old, of um, all the public housing across the whole U.S. and the only thing I wanted you to see in this table is that the percent of units that are in unwalkable locations is 71%. The percent of units that have good access is uh, 10%. And then the rest fall. So what's working against this walkable diversity is of course the question we have to ask ourselves. And we have the usual suspects, right? The cars, the highway lobby, the asphalt lobby, you know, folks pulling apart the human scale part of this. The, the, and then on the diversity part, the prejudice, the NIMBYs, the big corporations, big money, regulation, bad rules, mortgage deductions, the whole gamut of things that we have been talking about and that we know are not helping with trying to create this walkable diversity. Um, but we have some new things going on. And that's what I've been really kind of interested in, um, these, these new sort of things. I think there are conversations that I hear that are not in sync with each other. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, well, of course, the second thing is supply not meeting, not meeting demand. And that's kind of like, duh, of course. But um, let me tell you about the conversations. There's, there's people that are talking all about density, good urban form, code reform, complete streets, civic realm, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then there's the folks talking about diversity and they're talking about affordable housing and we need a right to the city and we need to have social equity and land trust and all these things that need to happen to make cities for everyone and inclusive. And I find that I would like these conversations to be more in sync I think new urbanism is trying very hard to keep these conversations in sync. But what happens is you have things like this. Um, this is a, what do you call this? A graphic, uh, something or another, infographic, it's called. So this is all about touting the benefits of walkable urbanism. But what's really going on here is it's all about the money. It's all about making the argument, you know, Hey, if you are in walkable areas, you can ask for four thousand to thirty-five thousand more. You know, um, there's a seventy-four percent premium in rents. Look at all these higher retail prices. Look at all these higher rents. So that's the walkability people um, really touting that side of what walkability is, uh, monetizing walkability. Which is fine, but I think it has to be done in a way that's a little more balanced with what's going on on the other side. This one is really truly awful. This is um, somebody put together this website that sort of rates neighborhoods. They you see you get a score on your neighborhood. Um, livability index, um, deeper insights into your neighborhood. And I couldn't believe it when I found on this website, okay, Here's a neighborhood that has a score of 73 for livability. Um, but demographics, they do very poorly. And the, the ranking is based on income. Like the higher income you are, the better the neighborhood. And they have on their website. We just genuinely believe that if there are more educated people, it's a nicer neighborhood. And the same with income. So just very explicitly, you know, this is a high income neighborhood, you score higher. So that's what I mean about, you know, kind of a dissonance going on. On the other side of the equation, that's a problem too, in my opinion. Um, some affordable housing folks, really good people doing Herculean efforts trying to get more affordable housing. But here, um, there's this particular group is saying what we need to do is expand access to cars to help families use vouchers in low poverty areas. Okay, you see how that's kind of working at cross purposes with the walkability um, uh, goal. 
Um, this is something the Kirwan Institute, here they are, this is kind of unbelievable, rating um, the opportunities of the city of ba around Baltimore. And they have the city itself is deemed very low opportunity. So in other words, what's happening is, and this is being reflected in government policies now, get people out to the suburbs. Get poor people out to the suburbs. That is the lowest opportunity area is the very core of the city. And I think that there's a real problem with that kind of approach. So, um, so that was more you know, conversations not really being connected. And then there is just the simple lack of supply and demand. I think a lot of people in the US are over the 20th century uh, low density sprawl thing. It's still happening, but so many people have now switched positions and demographically with the millennials, the aging boomers, the people not getting married and having kids, all that demographic change. And there's been wonderful research documenting how all of this is playing out right now and how in the next 20, 30 years it's going to get even worse. Um, but also, it's just amazing. This is a, a um, one of our big um, gauge uh, surveyors of public attitude in the U.S. is the um, Pew Research Center. And I couldn't believe when I saw this report just a couple years ago that now almost half of the population says they want to live in these walkable, diverse neighborhoods. Well, that is completely changed from 10, 20 years ago. We used to think, oh, maybe 20% would go for this, you know, but now it's nearly half, so it really has changed. Um, so uh, we have kind of, I guess the message there being one of the culprits of sprawl, as we've always talked about, just the lifestyle of the American middle class has just been really wanting to sprawl more and more, and in some sense, we've sort of bring that in or at least half of the population. Um, this is about demographic change coming down the road. Um, another uh, sort of thing that's happening here is when you look at the relationship between density and, um, and housing price in the, in the US. Um, here are the housing price quartiles for a relatively low density kind of area. Um, less than seven units per acre. And you see it's pretty evenly divided. If you, so if you looked at all the housing that was less than seven units per acre, it would be divided pretty much in force, um, high, low, medium, high, medium, low housing price. <coughs> Here's what happens when you uh, look at the, that housing price distribution for those walk score neighborhoods that have a lot of walkability, 90 plus, um, you see, as I've been saying, they're getting completely priced out. Um, and then when you look at this for density, and there was a, a book that came out a few years ago that made a big splash, um, a country of cities really arguing for the Jane Jacobs case that we need more density. We are screwed if we don't get more serious about density. And um, a lot of people agree with that, including me, but you do have this problem that if you look, it was advocating for 30 plus units per acre should be our metric going forward, our sort of baseline. Um, the housing price quartiles in those 30 plus per acre, uh, 30 units per acre neighborhoods, you can see how the housing price distribution plays out. Okay, so enough of the whining. What are we going to do here? Strategies. Uh, there's one theme is about why don't people start moving to other places that have walkability characteristics, and but they're just not Manhattan and San Francisco and Chicago and LA. <coughs> and there have been some, uh, even WalkScore, the good folks at WalkScore, <laughs> have been looking at cities where you can live affordably in a walkable neighborhood. So that does still exist. Let's um, focus on those. How about just creating new diverse neighborhoods, more of those? And um, here's where the new urbanists were very much picking up the, 
the project here a few years ago, kind of settled down now. Um, you can either subsidize existing neighborhoods or have new completely planned communities. In terms of subsidizing existing, this is just a sample of all the different projects and programs and investment strategies and tax breaks and nonprofits and all the effort and energy going into trying to make <coughs> those walkable areas more affordable to some people. And that's all great effort. Um, new planned communities, here's where the new urbanists come in. Um, initially, a lot of, and maybe still so, a lot of these new urbanist communities that were being built, and these are kind of like the, the next generation of those garden cities um, or garden suburbs. Um, they were a lot of these were market rate um, housing developments. A lot of them, not all of them. And the last, by my last count, there were 320 um, traditional neighborhood developments, as we call them, um, around the U.S. And I did a survey on, well, who could a teacher afford to live in one of these new urbanist neighborhoods? And I found that actually a teacher, a median, uh, the median income and a cook, very few of these were affordable at that time. This state study needs to be redone. But on the other hand, at least in these new urbanist communities, there was this language about you know, diversity and the importance of it. So I felt that that was really a positive thing because the most, the standard issue suburban development in the US could give a crap about diversity. So I, I really credit these developers who are in the new urbanism with at least being attuned to what we're trying to go for here. Um, and then the last strategy, which um, I've become more interested in, especially since moving to Chicago, is to focus on how can we take places that are either affordable or walkable and you know make them try to get them in such a way that they are both of those things so one thing if you look at here's chicago again okay so here's the downtown and this is that area i showed you it's uh not affordable and you know we could argue about definitions of this, but um, in my definition, all this area is not really uh, affordable, but it is walkable. And then you have the areas in red that are walkable and affordable. And it's almost like this is the next wave waiting to be gentrified. So what can we, with full knowledge about the march of affordability and walkability, um, the march of non-affordability and walkability coming on. What can we do more strategically for these areas? And one thing we might look at is what about the places that are not walkable, they are affordable, but they have den pretty good density so far. What can we do strategically to get them to be more of these walkable, diverse neighborhoods? Different kind of policies needed for those places. Um, and I've been looking at where is money being spent. These TIF monies are public, uh, city of Chicago investments in placemaking, streetscapes, you know, trees, better sidewalks, you know, all kinds of placemaking kind of um, investment going on. Well, why is, how is that being done in relation to these areas that are you know, have some density, they're not right now walkable, um, but they do have that density and they definitely are affordable. So how could that, does it, what does it mean to better target those investments? That's one thing I'm, I'm interested in looking at right now. Um, and this is my last slide. I, I kind of like to close with this last um, meeting of um, the Modernist Architects, the Congress for Modern Architecture. Um, which, um, you know, the new urbanists were sort of modeled metaphorically after the CM, the modernist architects, and their last meeting in the Netherlands in 1959, and they're all looking really depressed and serious and, you know, like, oh, we're, we're doomed. And so um, I think the new urbanists are really not feeling like this at all, but I think they do need to keep up the conversation about getting these two 
meta principles to not work at odds with each other, but to work in sync and uh, build more of such places going forward. Thank you.